Hi there, my name is Mark Baum. I work for Saliant Consulting. Welcome to my Claris Engage 2020 session, Listen to Your Heart, Soft Skills and High Tech. This is the first of six videos exploring basic concepts around emotional intelligence. In this video, I'll introduce myself and give you an idea about how I plan to approach the subject. So who am I? Well, I'm a senior application developer at Saliant, a consulting company, and a few years back I worked at Claris, where I helped to produce the previous incarnation of this conference. I'm a public speaker and performer, trained as an actor, storyteller, and singer, and I love to conduct interviews. I've been doing that since I was a teenager. I don't have formal training in this field. I'm not a psychologist or a neurologist or even an MBA. I'm offering this session with the sincere hope that it's useful to you. But anything you try based on what I share in these videos is at your own risk. Although I'm not an expert, I am a thinking, feeling human being just like you. And thinking and feeling is what this session is all about. I'd like this session to leave you feeling self-reflective and self-aware, aware of the impact your emotions have on other people and on yourself. Here's one of my favorite quotes from Buddhist teacher Pema Shojun. The only reason we don't open our hearts and minds to other people is because those people trigger confusion in us, which we don't feel brave enough or sane enough to deal with. To the degree that we look clearly and compassionately at ourselves, we feel confident and fearless about looking into someone else's eyes. For years, my managers would always tell me, Mark, you're so emotionally intelligent. And I would think, well, at least there's some way that I'm smart. <laughs> but until I started preparing this talk, I never took the time to understand what emotionally intelligent really meant. So I sat down to read. I read bestsellers by journalist Daniel Goleman, a survey by psychologist Jason Satterfield, and a critique by neuroscientist Lisa Feldman Barrett. I discovered a whole taxonomy of emotion and behavior and skills. In some areas, like intuiting other people's states of mind, I was off the charts. But in others, not so much. In fact, they were things I already knew I was pretty bad at, like nurturing and maintaining relationships that I hadn't thought of as emotional intelligence. I found that people have been discussing this idea for at least 30 years. I began with the work of Daniel Goleman, a psychologist and journalist who popularized the term in the mid-90s. He put together a conceptual framework a hierarchy of definitions and recommendations to encourage growth in this area, especially in the business world. Here's his definition. Emotional intelligence is a set of skills that involve applying our intelligence to our emotional life. These skills, such as managing your emotions and maintaining relationships, can support your well-being and the well-being of the people you work with. It's worth giving this your attention because our emotions influence so many of the things we do and say, the ways we interact with other people, and how we motivate ourselves and the groups we're part of. As you become aware of your emotions, you can start to make choices about them, which in psychology is called managing or regulating your emotions. I prefer to imagine myself partnering with them and sometimes letting them guide me. I don't want them to control me, but setting out to control them doesn't feel right either. When we partner with our emotions, we're partnering with ourselves, and that prepares us to partner effectively with others as well, whom we also don't have complete control over, whether at home or at work. And speaking of work, that's where we have to balance the expectation of professional reserve and detachment on one hand, and on the other, the intimacy and friendship that comes from spending so many hours solving problems together. These connections can form not only with coworkers, but also with long-term clients. On top of that, the stakes are really high. We're talking about our livelihoods, often our passions, and of course, our egos. Emotional intelligence can help make sense of this obstacle course and provide tools for navigating it. My session is grounded in the reading that I did, especially Goleman's work, but it also reflects my point of view. I'm using his conceptual framework, which I'll discuss later, and projecting it onto my personal experience. My hope is that you'll do the same thing, and that this will lead to new insights for you. I realize that you may or may not have much exposure to these ideas, and that's okay. I've designed the session to be fun and engaging regardless of your familiarity with these concepts, or your practice of them, for that matter. 
Your engagement matters to me. When I was planning this talk, I didn't want to just read books and then share a bunch of bullet points. I wanted us to hear real people's experience. So I went out and talked to people in the Claris community about their strengths and weaknesses. These conversations were a privilege, and I'm very grateful for them. Somehow, the spirit of the community came through, even on Zoom, with people taking risks and generously sharing from their lives. So what comes to mind is that I've always been extremely curious, and this has served me really well. I've always been fascinated with communicating with other people, and I've always been able to kind of get along with anyone. You really don't know how much your emotions can affect other people. And especially if you're in a leadership role. And I think, I think women go through this all the time of, of feeling like, oh, if I stand up for myself, I'll be considered uh, bitchy or whiny or problematic. One of the things that I didn't, I didn't realize for a while that I, I do is that I love to connect people because everyone needs people. Everyone needs friends, connections, acquaintances, whatever it is. Even if it's just in that one moment, uh, connecting people can change the whole experience. I'm recording this session for you in the middle of August, 2020. And to be honest, right now things are looking kind of bleak. But I get to spend time listening to my friends' voices, choosing short sections to share with you. And that's such a pleasure, such a joy. Every one of these stories is a gift from them and from me to you. Here's an outline of what this session will cover. Some fundamental concepts, a tool for identifying your strengths and weaknesses, some strategies for growing your emotional intelligence, the stories I mentioned from members of the Claris community, and a list of the resources I consulted in preparing this talk. So that's the approach I'm taking. Hope it works for you. I look forward to digging into some fundamental concepts in the next video. I think we're going to have a lot of fun. Hello again. My name's Mark Baum. I work at Salient Consulting. Welcome back to my Claris Engage 2020 session, Listen to Your Heart, Soft Skills and High Tech. This is number two in a series of six videos exploring basic aspects of emotional intelligence. In this video, I'll introduce some fundamental concepts, outline five main areas of emotional intelligence, and give an example of how those might figure in a situation. Let's start with the fundamentals. What is personality? One definition says that personality is the combination of characteristics or qualities that form an individual's distinctive character. Another definition says that personality is about tendencies. Based on your personality, you might tend to experience some emotions more frequently than others. A fundamental idea around personality is that you're kind of stuck with it. But how much is personality determined by genetics or early childhood experience? Can it change during a person's lifetime? It's been observed to change radically as the result of a brain injury. Can it be shaped by the accumulation of experience? Can you get a better personality by acquiring emotional intelligence skills? Emotions. Emotions are tricky. What are they exactly? Well, there's something that you feel. There aren't a lot of words for this in English. Affections, sentiments, passions. They're feelings. Nothing more than feelings. Science doesn't do much better in terms of getting specific about what emotions are. They've been described as arousals of the nervous system or responses to external and external events, or subjective experiences both mental and somatic deriving from circumstances, mood, or relationships. But there is the idea that they can get out of control and cause us to behave in unexpected ways. One of the purposes of emotional intelligence is to manage our wayward passions. What do you think emotions are? I've already shared Goleman's definition of the term emotional intelligence, which he published in the mid-90s. The term first appeared as early as the 1960s, though it didn't get much attention. It came into greater focus around 1990 in the work of professors Peter Salovey and John Mayer, who were conducting research that attempted to scientifically measure the difference between people's abilities in managing their emotions. Here's the definition that they published. Emotional intelligence is the ability to monitor one's own and other people's emotions. 
to discriminate between different emotions and label them appropriately, and to use emotional information to guide thinking and behavior. Here are some examples. You can detach from your emotions for objectivity and fairness. You can harness your emotions for motivation and focus. You can witness other people's emotions for empathy and compassion. And you can synchronize your emotions with other people to improve collaboration and teamwork. Emotional intelligence has been divided up into various areas. Goleman proposes five of them. Self-awareness, which is recognizing your own emotions and patterns of behavior. Self-regulation, which is the ability to manage your emotions. Social awareness, which is recognizing the emotional states of others and reading group dynamics. Social regulation, which is the ability to manage your interactions with others and influence other people's emotions and behavior. And finally, motivation, which is understanding your needs and wants and how they impact and interact with the needs and wants of other people. Here's an example of a common situation described in terms of this framework. Given a specific situation, determine what you want and how you feel about it. Let's say you have an unexpected and urgent reason to take a day off, but you're on a project with challenging deadlines. How do you feel about going to your manager to ask for the time off? Even though it's an urgent situation, you still need to wait for the right moment to ask. Imagine what your manager might feel about your request. When you actually meet with them, gauge their mood. Is this the right time to ask? What will they need from you in order to support this? As the conversation continues, reflect back what you're hearing from them. If they have concerns, repeat those concerns back to them. Work together to find a solution that meets your needs but addresses their concerns. Now let's say you can't agree on a solution. Find a way to end the conversation respectfully and thank them for considering your request. After you get that rejection, you might feel unmotivated about your work. Give yourself a little time to process your feelings around this. But finally, look for constructive action that you can take to address your needs. That action might be letting go of the situation and accepting that you can't take the time off. Or it might be waiting to see if either of you comes up with a solution that didn't emerge in the meeting. This creative thinking is more likely to take place if you aren't dwelling in resentment about the rejection, and if you made your urgent needs clear to your manager without shaming them for not helping you out and without getting pissed off at them. Basically, if you left them with the desire to help find a solution. We could also tell this story from the manager's point of view and consider their responsibilities. But you know, I've been thinking about how we don't get much training to be employees. Managers get training, if they're lucky, but we just assume that people know how to work or we expect them to figure it out in the first few jobs that they get. Maybe this sink or swim approach has left you with some gaps that could be filled in by learning more about emotional intelligence. Up to this point, I've been sharing the basic concepts of emotional intelligence as they were discussed about 20 to 25 years ago. More recently, the research of neuroscientists like Lisa Feldman Barrett has impacted the field significantly. Where sociologists and psychologists initially argued that people's faces show consistent expressions when they feel specific emotions and you can learn to read those expressions, neuroscientists are now arguing that people express the same emotions in many different ways and that our brains are predicting machines. That is, we guess how people are feeling based on our experience, on the patterns we recognize, but we never can be sure that we're right. For a quick take on some of this, I recommend the video that I've included in the resources or the University of Cambridge website that discusses a phenomenon called perceptual insight. I've tried to keep the advances in neuroscience in mind, but for the purposes of this talk, I focused mostly on Goleman. Although he's the least scientific of the people I read, I like his approachable and actionable advice. It's felt pretty effortless to apply his framework to my experience in order to better organize and understand it. And that's what I'd like to do next, with you. Hello again, my name is Mark Baum. I work at Salant Consulting. Welcome back to my Claris Engage 2020 session, Listen to Your Heart, Soft Skills in High Tech. This is the third of six videos that explore various concepts in emotional intelligence. 
In this video, I'll introduce a self-assessment tool created by Daniel Goleman, with some personal commentary on my part. Before we start, I'd like to share some thoughts on self-assessment. I'm the personality type that hates the idea of personality types, or at least the belief that we can create multiple choice tests that say meaningful things about who we are, and that attitude extends to tests intended to measure emotional intelligence. I'm okay with self-assessment if we're not trying to quantify things, but instead are asking open-ended questions about ourselves. That's the approach I'd like to take now. In his book, Working with Emotional Intelligence, Daniel Goleman proposed a series of competencies, a hierarchy of on-the-job skills, to help managers assess their employees. These competencies are also useful for self-evaluation, so I want to share them with you as a way of identifying your strengths and weaknesses. He divides them into two categories. Personal, with two subcategories, self-awareness and motivation, and social, with the subcategories of empathy and interaction. You may find that you're strong in one area, weak in another, or weak in everything. I hope you won't worry too much about that. This isn't a judgment on your worth as a human being. It's an attempt at knowing yourself better so you can leverage your strengths, choose where you want to grow, and decide what you don't really care about. So, let's start with the personal self-awareness competencies. I'm going to look at each one, think about how it plays out in my life, and then share those thoughts with you. Then I'll give you the chance to go through the same process. How often are you aware of your emotions? I pay a lot of attention to my emotions and how they affect me. How careful are you with your work and with your word? I can get pretty detail-oriented with my work, but I don't always do things when I say I will. Can people trust you? I certainly want people to trust me, so if I do something wrong, I usually call attention to it. Can you assess yourself objectively? I guess this is the moment to find out. I have trouble with this. I'm fearful and self-critical and don't appreciate my strengths. As a result, my self-confidence doesn't have a strong foundation. How is your self-confidence? And how well do you regulate your emotions? I tend to feed whatever emotion I'm feeling, rather than gently encouraging myself in another direction. I have this idea that I should see the feeling through, but I don't think things work that way. And now I'd like you to assess yourself. Just pause the video for a little while and consider your own strengths and weaknesses. Great. Next are the personal competencies having to do with motivation. What are you committed to? I bring a lot of commitment to my work. How do you innovate? I love to find creative and unusual approaches to things. For example, this talk. Are you an optimist? I struggle with this. I'm always anticipating the worst outcomes in any situation, and this can affect my initiative, especially getting new projects started. What's your level of initiative? And how well do you adapt to changing circumstances? I don't much like change, whether it's a new living situation or a client who takes an unexpected direction during the development process. What drives you? I'm driven by deadlines and a sense of obligation. The best way to get me to do something is to make me feel obliged to do it, like paying me. That usually works. But every once in a while I do a project that's driven by passion, like the interviews for this session or my musical recordings. Take a minute now and pause the video and reflect on your own strengths and weaknesses in this area. Good. Next are the empathic competencies. How good are you at observing others? I'm not great at observing other people from the outside, but I have an unusual perception of them from the inside. And how well do you understand them? My intuition is way off the charts, and I'm really good at imagining what people are feeling and how those feelings are affecting their behavior. Basically, I get an emotional reading on somebody first. Psychic powers, predictive brain, who knows? And then I work my way outwards to explain it. Do you like to develop others' talents? I'm a great coach when we can take our time, and when I feel the person I'm working with is making an effort. But when there's pressure to get a lot done, or when I feel they don't really care, I have a tendency to get kind of directive. How do you feel about providing service? This is most rewarding for me when I see the impact that I'm having. When that's not clear, I tend to lose interest or get discouraged. How well do you work with people who are different from you? 
I do my best to act as an ally for people who are different from me, and I believe that a diverse group of problem solvers tends to come up with better solutions. But in practice, it's not always easy for me to listen to people who look at problems in a totally different way. What are your strengths and weaknesses in this area? Excellent. There's one more area of competencies, the interactive ones. Fasten your seatbelt, there's going to be a lot of them. I'm an excellent communicator. How about you? I'm also a good collaborator, but I'm terrible at networking. I hate to feel that I'm imposing on people or that they have expectations of me. And basically, that's what networking is all about. One of my great regrets in life is how poorly I've maintained many of my relationships. I've missed many opportunities and lost friendships as well. But now let's talk about you. Maybe you're great at navigating politics and you love to create change and inspire people, and you're a ninja for mediating conflict, but you don't like to build teams or manage personnel or lead organizations. Guess what? You could work as a consultant. In fact, I imagine that's what some of you do. Go ahead and take a moment to consider your strengths and weaknesses in this area. Very good. That's the end of my summary of Goldman's competencies. His complete system is significantly more complex and maybe a little different from what I've represented here. Check out his book, Working with Emotional Intelligence, if you want to learn more. Before I wrap up this video, I'd like to share one more thing. Although it's not included in the classic model of emotional intelligence, I'd like to introduce the idea of cultural competency as well. It's the ability to navigate culturally diverse working environments. If, as the neuroscientists say, your brain is predicting, guessing, what's going on for other people, you need exposure to their culture, and luck, to make informed guesses. Additionally, the more experience you have with the diversity of cultures, the less likely it is that you'll make the unconscious assumption that everyone conforms to your cultural norms. This will make your guesses, and behavior, less biased. I'd like to take a moment and share some of my journey around cultural competency. I grew up white and middle class, and though my parents made sure that I had some exposure to other cultures, I still had the sense that my point of view was the real one, and people from other cultures were interesting but sort of extra. Given the opportunity, they would want to live the way I did, and maybe, I don't know, do their culture on the side. But then I came out as gay at age 15, at a time when this was still unusual and quite difficult. My family had a hard time with it and it was the start of the AIDS epidemic, and effectively, I felt that I'd been kicked out of the world that I'd known. But part of me, even at that moment, recognized this as a gift. It was like I had a little window on the experience of people who had never felt part of the dominant culture, and that started me asking a lot of questions. Later, I did theater in Mexico, and then I married a guy from Colombia. And in the 20 years he and I have been together, I've learned a lot about cultural competency and how often I still fall into believing that my cultural social training and my relative privilege should give me some special authority or make me right when we have a disagreement. And the same thing happens at work. I have to catch myself being right, sort of summoning up this voice of authority that has roots not only in my expertise, but also in my unearned position in the social order. It's not easy to tease these things apart, but I've found that working on this has made me a better collaborator, a better listener, and it makes my work relationships richer. A friend of mine, after seeing a draft of this video, reminded me that when you grow up outside the dominant culture, cultural competency is not a choice, as I've been presenting it here, but an essential skill. For example, in the United States, Many black people live in a state of vigilance about how white culture operates. Their success, and even their personal safety, can depend on sophisticated cultural competence. This is a moment when people around the world are giving attention to these questions. We live in an increasingly global society with increasingly serious challenges, and we need to find a way to work together, not just to succeed in the workplace, but to have some hope of survival. For these reasons and more, I'd encourage you to make cultural competency another dimension of your investigation into emotional intelligence and into how you behave with other people. What did you learn about yourself from doing these exercises? Which areas can you count on? Which ones do you think you need to strengthen? And which ones do you just want to ignore? 
In the next video, I'll share some techniques you can try for addressing those areas that you think need to get a little stronger. Hello again, my name is Mark Baum. I work at Salian Consulting. Welcome back to my Claris Engage session, Listen to Your Heart, Soft Skills in High Tech. This is number four in a series of six videos exploring concepts around emotional intelligence. Since you just evaluated your strengths and weaknesses, in this video I'll share some strategies for growth. Some of these strategies for growth are inspired by Goldman and others, but most of them are mine. They are grouped into the five areas of emotional intelligence, self-awareness, self-regulation, social awareness, social regulation, and motivation. I'll start with some strategies for increasing self-awareness, that is, learning to recognize your own emotions and patterns of behavior. Observe yourself. Witness your emotions without judging them in any way. If a feeling is uncomfortable, try to sit with it rather than distracting yourself. It may feel counterintuitive, but letting yourself feel the discomfort is a lot less work than struggling against it. Identify your triggers or hot-button issues and see if you can get a little distance from the feelings they bring up. I get that distance by talking to my feelings as though they're separate from me. If something throws me into an unnecessarily hypervigilant state, I say, well, hello, hypervigilance. You showed up right away. Thanks for looking out for me, but I think I'm good now. Keep an emotional journal where you identify at least some emotional state that got your attention that day. If a journal's not your thing, try something else. Talk to your dog. Think about it when you're doing the dishes. But try to commit to the same activity every day. Ask for feedback from people whom you trust to be honest and thoughtful. If you feel that you must respond to their feedback, limit yourself to asking questions and repeating what you've heard. So those were a few self-awareness strategies. There are plenty more, including meditation, which is also a self-regulation strategy. And that brings me to the strategies for improving self-regulation. Learning to control, or partner with, your emotions. There are a number of strategies here, so I've put them into three groups. Somatic, or body-centered, verbal, and tactical. A lot of these you can use in meetings. Let's start with the somatic ones. Take a deep breath. It's a cliché, but a deep breath stimulates the vagus nerve, lowering your heart rate and your blood pressure. Sip water. Dehydration can raise your cortisol levels, and the act of sipping itself can be comforting and relaxing. It's also a great way to stop conversation for a moment, when you need to think. Notice your extremities. If you've lost track of your body, maybe you've leaned too far into a conversation with somebody else, try focusing your attention on your fingers and your toes. Wiggle them a little, then notice how the rest of your body is feeling. Tap your knees. This is an interesting one. It's an informal version of a therapeutic technique I learned for processing trauma. Here's what you do. You can do this in a meeting if you're subtle about it. Place your hands on your thighs with your fingertips touching the outsides of your knees. With your right middle finger, tap the outside of your right knee. With your left middle finger, tap the outside of your left knee. Keep tapping, alternating sides. Inhale for four taps in a rhythm and exhale for four taps. Then. Little by little, slow down the tapping, continuing to match your breath to the same number of taps, allowing a sense of calm to come over you as the rhythm slows. That's the end of the somatic self-regulation strategies. Next, I'm going to look at some verbal strategies. Name what you are feeling. If you feel something, say something. But really, the idea here is to recognize your feelings and increase your vocabulary for them. Check out the Atlas of Emotions website, created by Dr. Paul Ekman and his daughter, Eve Ekman. Say something comforting to yourself. To be honest, I'm talking to myself the entire day. First thing in the morning, I sit down at my desk and it's like, here we go, Mark, what you gonna do? And when I need encouragement, I say, you can do it. You can do it, Mark, come on, you can do it. Do you remember when people worked in offices? I do. Back then, this habit embarrassed me because I don't have a lot of control over it. But now that I'm working out of my bedroom, I can say whatever I want. Take notes to express your feelings. I take a lot of notes in meetings on a pad of paper. I'm not just documenting what's being said, 
I'm writing down whatever I don't have a chance to say, my ideas and my feelings. You've got to be careful about this if someone's looking over your shoulder. Fortunately, I have terrible handwriting. And that's the end of the verbal self-regulation strategies. The last set of these strategies is the tactical ones. Write drafts of charged communication. When you have strong feelings about something, try writing it down. Share your writing with somebody else and decide whether you should send it as an email or whether it would be better communicated in person. I know I'm over 50, but I would not try to communicate anything sensitive via text message. It puts too much pressure on people to respond quickly without your having access to the cues provided by each other's voices and body language. Visualize meetings before they happen, especially if it's an important meeting. Just walk through it in your mind. How do you need to prepare yourself, not just in terms of content, but emotionally? Consider your decisions and take your time. If you're pressured to decide right away, ask for whatever time you can get, even if it's just five minutes. Call someone you trust and talk it out with them. Make your decision thoughtfully instead of impulsively. For example, if a client asks you for an off-the-cuff estimate of a new project, tell them you don't want to mislead them and you need some time to get it right. That's the end of all the self-regulation strategies, somatic, verbal, and tactical. Which of these are you using already? Now I'll talk about some strategies for improving social awareness. This is about learning to recognize the emotional states of others and to read group dynamics. Study people. This is what actors and novelists do. I went to acting school and they made me do a lot of this. Everywhere you go, watch the people around you and tell yourself stories about what they're doing and thinking and feeling. Observe meetings and how people interact. Get yourself invited to some meetings where you don't really care about the outcome, so you can sit back and watch how people operate. Guess how people are feeling. When you're observing people, see what your intuition says they're feeling and what they might want. Then find out if you are right. If it's appropriate, check your intuition by asking those people what they really were feeling. See how far off you were. Bridge the gap. I need to say that at this moment, August 2020, some of my recommendations simply aren't possible because so many of us are working from home. So I'm going to take a moment to talk about remote meetings. I'm not sure what to recommend for them yet. We're not in the same room, and there's a delay that happens in transmitting the signal, so we're not reacting in real time, but to a moment slightly in the past. What effect does that have? I believe that it requires an act of imagination. We pretend that we're in the same room together and that we're reacting in the same moment. And that requires a level of engagement or effort that seems to produce a unique feeling of intimacy. But it's also hard work. These meetings wear me out. I'm not sure that a whole day of remote meetings is a good way to make decisions, and I recommend that we check in with each other and reschedule if we've lost the energy to sustain our attention for this imaginative act. That's the end of the social awareness strategies. I think they're kind of fun. Which one's your favorite? The next set of strategies are for social regulation. This is about relationship management, the ability to manage your interactions with others and influence others' emotions and behavior. Attune yourself. Allow yourself to get into the rhythm of the person you're meeting with. This is one of the reasons that people socialize before getting down to business. That's one of my big issues. I charge by the hour and I don't want to waste people's time, so I jump right into the issue at hand. That's what we're there for, right? But a little bit of friendly, gentle conversation can help you get into alignment with each other, to get attuned. During the meeting, demonstrate that you are present and listening. If you're actually feeling distracted by something, have the courage to acknowledge this and address the distraction or consider meeting at another time. Listen actively. Recognize other people's points of view, even if you disagree. Repeat back what you've understood to make sure that you've heard what they've said. Try to build on the other person's ideas rather than making abrupt changes to the conversation. Try some rules. Back when I was working at Claris, I attended, and sometimes ran, a lot of meetings. I had all kinds of ideas, and they were mostly smart, and I wanted people to hear them. But I was increasingly conscious of who was speaking in the meetings and who was not. So I'd give myself little rules, like I couldn't speak more than once unless everyone else spoke, or I couldn't speak unless two women had spoken before me. 
It wasn't easy to ask myself to sit and wait. People might miss out on my amazing idea. That was a real risk. But it was also possible that someone else might come up with it too. Or, if I made some space, they might come up with something better. Give thanks and credit. Don't forget to thank people for their time. And in meetings, be sure to credit other people's ideas when you want to build on them. That was something else that I started practicing consciously at Claris. I'd say something like, I really like that accordion design that Angela just proposed, and I'm wondering if we could reinforce that pattern at a higher level over here. Not only does it encourage teamwork, but there's a good chance that your idea is going to get some support from Angela. Coming back to thanks, what's the difference between thanks and gratitude? I'd say that gratitude has a deeper well of emotion behind it, and with practice, can become a state of being that encourages contentment and equanimity. One form of practice could involve writing a letter to someone who had an impact on your life, expressing your gratitude for how they guided or influenced you. And at work, you could thank your supervisor for taking you to lunch or for a bonus, but you'd express your gratitude for the way they foster a positive working environment, for example. I'm the sort of person who notices all the bad stuff first and wants to change it, so it takes care on my part to give my attention to the things that are going well and to acknowledge them. So, those were a few social regulation strategies. Which ones would you like to try? We've come to the final area, motivation, which is about understanding your needs and wants and how they interact with the needs and wants of other people. Here are some ways to grow in this area. Set goals and prioritize them. Break each goal down into a series of achievable tasks so you get the reward of consistent progress. If you're feeling uncomfortable or unexcited about your project, look for something small you can do that's easy or fun, something that helps you find a way in. This technique is risky because it's important to respect the client's priorities and not let yourself wander too far away from them, but if there's a big obstacle in your way, sometimes it helps to walk around it. Establish rewards for yourself. Give yourself praise or a treat when each task is complete. One of my favorite rewards is ice cream. But sadly, ice cream seems to stop being a reward for me. It just becomes lunch. Acknowledge setbacks. When an obstacle gets in your way, take a moment to feel your reaction, whether it's disappointment or anger or frustration. Then review your goals, figure out how to work around it, and recommit. Sometimes I'm too upset and I can't do this on my own. That's when I call up one of my coworkers and say, Help me. Do you see any way around this? Respect your priorities. Make the time for the things you've decided are most important. If you have trouble saying no to people, start practicing it consciously, beginning with low-stakes situations. If you get pushed back, see how it feels to let the other person be disappointed or angry. Does the world end? Reframe resistance. Even when something is good for us and we enjoy doing it, some part of our mind can resist engaging in the activity. For me, that's exercise. When you resist something that's good for you, try to listen to the resisting voice. You may be able to shift your thinking. For example, if you find yourself thinking, I should get up and run before breakfast, every day, for the rest of my life. Try saying instead, I just have to do this today. Tomorrow can happen later. And if you're thinking, but I'm tired and I want to stay in bed, you can say, if I do this now, I'll feel more awake later. I might actually enjoy it more than lying here in bed playing with my phone. Leverage habits. Create a routine to help you work consistently. If something's important to you, try doing it at the same time and in the same place every day. Habits can be really powerful, especially if you feel that you lack discipline. Routines feel easier to defend as well. It's easier to say no if you can tell somebody, I'm sorry, I have that time reserved for an important activity. Cultivate discipline. Discipline is doing something consistently, whether you feel like it or not. It's the active complement to habit. It may feel like the opposite of motivation, but habit and discipline are what keep you going when motivation fails. You can cultivate discipline in something you love to do, or something that you hate. I love to sing, but when my life gets busy, it's one of the first things to go. I haven't yet figured out why. On the other hand, I hate housework, 
but I'm committed to washing the dishes and keeping the kitchen organized. Where in your life have you cultivated discipline? Where is it missing? I'm the sort of person who can only stand a certain amount of discipline in a given day. It's like I use it up at work. But maybe you're the opposite and need encouragement to break free. Break the cycle. Mood and behavior can form a negative feedback loop that's hard to escape. I'm kind of a sad person, and singing sad, passionate music helps me express that. But maybe it also makes me sadder. One approach to breaking cycles like this is called behavioral activation. It's a form of cognitive behavioral therapy intended to alleviate depression. It involves identifying the cycle you're in, finding easy positive activities that could shift your mood, planning them and getting support in following the plan, and slowly retraining your brain to expect the reward of these activities. There's a link in the resources. Those are the motivation strategies I have to share. I keep thinking of more strategies to add to this presentation, but I figure it's time to stop. I'm also concerned I've been a little glib here. Making changes in our lives can be difficult. I've dealt with depression since childhood, and while there are things I can do on my own to address it, I've also needed help. Maybe you do too. That help can come in the form of a coach for support with developing positive habits, a spiritual or philosophical counselor to, to address questions of meaning, or a therapist or psychiatrist for trauma and mental health concerns. I've tried them all, and they've all been helpful to me. Making use of these resources, if you have access to them, is not an admission of weakness. It can transform your life, or at least nudge you in a good direction. What have you tried? And what things do you still want to try? If you have any strategies of your own for growing emotional intelligence, I would love it if you'd share them in the comments. You can also just talk about your personal experience. In the next video, I'll describe the interview process, which was all about asking my friends to share their experience. Hello again, my name is Mark Baum. I work for Saliant Consulting. Welcome back to my Claris Engage 2020 session, Listen to Your Heart, Soft Skills in High Tech. This is number five in a series of six videos exploring basic concepts in emotional intelligence. In this video, I'll tell you about some interviews I conducted with my friends, wrap up this formal presentation, if formal is the right word, and share some resources. The final video, number six, consists of the interviews themselves. When I was preparing this talk, I didn't want it just to be a bunch of bullet points, and I didn't want it to be all about me. I wanted you to witness other people being vulnerable and honest, not giving advice, but just talking about themselves in a way that might resonate with you. So I met with 18 people from the Claris community to explore their strengths and weaknesses with respect to emotional intelligence. Actually, I talked to a few more people than that, but some videos had technical issues and so I couldn't include them. Although our goal was to produce something to share with you, I asked each person to talk just with me, to forget about having an audience and share whatever they were prepared to trust me with. They would get to review the final result and could ask me not to publish it if it felt too revealing. Everyone was amazing. They were so open and so completely themselves, and almost all of them approved their videos, which I appreciated very much. I asked about three things. What's something you love about yourself? A trait or skill in the emotional intelligence domain that you can lean on and almost take for granted? How has that helped your career? I thought this would be the fun part for everybody. I considered it the icebreaker part of the interview, and it was, for maybe half the people. For the others, it was difficult to say anything good about themselves. My next area of inquiry was, can you tell me about a weakness that you identified at some point in the past, that you worked on until you moved the needle on it? How did you do that? What specific things did you do? And the final area was the most sensitive. Is there something that's still really hard for you? Something you haven't been able to change? How do you feel about that? What have you tried that hasn't worked? And how do you prevent this from damaging your professional life? How do you repair things when something goes wrong? Understandably, people were a little reticent to share their weaknesses because they knew you'd see them. That takes courage. But the best way for us to learn from each other is by talking honestly about what's hard. Here's a sneak preview of the videos in case you're curious. I can be feeling completely discombobulated and, you know, not very well rested and maybe not even very prepared. 
And yet there's something about that, that moment that says it's go time where I switch into pro mode. Uh, I, I don't connect to people all that easily. I find it hard to make like actual real connections with people. Um, and that's just, that's always been true in my work, in my life outside of work. It's, it's true everywhere I go. Like nobody teaches you how to fight with your significant other, right? You, you don't go to class for that, right? They teach like all sorts of ridiculous stuff in high school. But like the one, I remember the first time that Christy and I shared an apartment together. She's like, you got to go to therapy. With the things that I have gone through, losing a job, being responsible for uh, my family financially, you start to calculate all of the risks that you take. I don't like when I don't get my way. And so, <laughs> and so you know, whereas uh, managing is challenging for me, um, I like to be in a leadership position with whatever group I'm in. It's very hard for me to just like take a seat on the bus. It's great to be able to get along with everybody. And then there are times when I need to say something that isn't going to be, you know, it's not what someone wants to hear, and, but it still needs to be said. And I hate it. 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 Uh, in every part of my life forever. Being the parent of a 12 year old girl who saw her mom pass away is, leaves me incredibly vulnerable. And there are times that I'm like floundering, looking for this strength that I, that the acceptance has offered me, but not being quite able to find it. Uh, I'm not, I'm not good at this by any means. I think I'm, I'm self-aware enough to know the moments when, I'm, when I fail but it doesn't mean that I don't fail. I fail all the time. <laughs> I screw up constantly. If you like what you see, please be sure to watch the final part of this session. There are also a lot more interview clips I didn't include. I'll make those available on YouTube a little while after this session is released. They'll be linked to a blog post at the Salang Consulting website. And now, the formal part of my session is coming to a close. I'd like to review what it was all about. I introduced some fundamental concepts. I offered a tool for identifying your strengths and weaknesses. I shared some strategies for growing your emotional intelligence. And I described the interview process for the personal stories that I hope you'll take the time to hear. Now I'd like to share some of the resources I consulted in preparing this presentation. They provide different points of view on the topic, both in terms of the original system as laid out by Mayer and Salovey, the popularized version by Goleman, and the evolving challenges to it from neuroscientists like Barrett Feldman. I especially recommend the panel video from the Simmons Institute. They talk about childhood development, psychedelics, schizophrenia, and computer science, all in the context of the predictive brain. Thank you to everyone who listened to early versions of this talk and gave me their feedback, especially my mom, who always hears the talk first when it's really, really bad, and my brilliant coach Jenna Savell who has the gift of seeing right to the heart of a story, naming it, and bringing it forward. Check out her website if you want to improve your public speaking. That's the end of my formal session. Thank you for spending this time with me. Don't forget, though, that there's another video with all the stories told by my friends. I would have loved to have spent this time with you in person. Uh, it would have been pretty lively, I bet. But even on video, I hope it's kind of moved stuff around inside of you and, and been helpful. Please do share comments, uh, see if we can start a lively discussion. And take good, good care of yourself, okay? Bye for now. Hello again. My name's Mark Baum. I work for Salient Consulting. Welcome back to my Claris Engage 2020 session, Listen to Your Heart soft skills and high tech. This is the last of a series of six videos exploring basic concepts in emotional intelligence. The previous five videos were my formal presentation. This video consists of the personal stories that were told to me by my friends in the Claris community. They talked to me about their strengths and weaknesses in the area of emotional intelligence. I learned a great deal listening to them and I hope that you do too.
I can be feeling completely discombobulated and, you know, not very well rested and maybe not even very prepared. And yet there's something about that, that moment that says it's go time where I switch into pro mode and things just fall into place. And I've been able to trust that very frequently. Um, well, almost all the time. I can just say, oh, you know, hey, it's time to do your DevCon presentation. You're on. It's time to lead a meeting that, you know, that's going to be contentious. It's time to tackle that rough piece of code that you've been putting off a little bit. It's just, you know, whatever that go time is. It's almost like putting on a code or putting on lipstick or something. It's just like there's a switch. It's just a switch. It's like go time. Okay, just do it. I feel like it's like going on stage. It is in a way a role, right? Your professional role. It's a way. And, and I can remember walking down a long hall at a big clients and knowing that I'm going into a meeting and I'm just walking down the hall and I'm taking, just taking a couple of deep breaths and I'm really not even trying to formulate the issues. It's just like, okay, stand up tall. You're not very imposing. So stand up tall and, you know, and just be there and be on. And when you walk in that room, enter, be there. If you really are in a tapped out state or you've got a, something really difficult going on and you do this, does it, what impact does it have on you when it's over? Is there any cost or anything? See, that's a great question. I've only recently realized that that depending on that too much um, is it can be a problem. I mean, it, it's not a substitute for self care to be really successful in business. It's you still got to do the you know feed yourself good food and um, burn a candle or take a hot bath or whatever it is. It's not. It's definitely not a substitute. Um, it feels great. It feels great to take a meeting that looks like it's going south and figure out who needs what and thread the needle and make everybody happy and end it so that it's successful. But yeah, there's a cost to that. I mean, particularly for somebody like me who's introverted. I can remember leaving some meetings that were really successful, um, where we really made a lot of progress and sitting in my car for a few minutes and just breathing quietly until I could start the car and drive home. Yeah, there's definitely a cost to it. You know what my supposition is on this. Um, there's a certain way that meeting leaders look, and it might be a certain age, it might be a certain, um, you know, college background, it might be a certain gender, it might be, and, and you and I are not that. And it both makes it easier to perform in that role and harder because we're not performing as who we are. I would suspect that that's what feels so tiring about it. I don't connect to people all that easily. I find it hard to make like actual real connections with people. Um, and that's just, that's always been true in my work, in my life outside of work. It's, it's true everywhere I go. Um, yeah, it's, it's, uh, I don't know. It's tough. I just, I, 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 I really want people to feel like I appreciate them because I really do appreciate many people. I appreciate you, for example. Um, and I don't know if it's my tone of voice or if it's my specific brain chemistry, but I just always sound like I'm being sarcastic. No matter what it is I say, I always sound like I'm being sarcastic. And um, in addition to that, I have trouble understanding social rules. They, um, my natural desire is oversharing and being completely honest, and that is not the social. That is not a social norm. That's not. That doesn't get you. That doesn't work well in most social situations. 
Um, so yeah, the way that I deal with it work-wise is I'm either all the way honest or basically don't speak at all. I'm either silent or I'm completely honest. I don't, I don't really know many, many methods of being in between there. Um, it, fe- it, cause it, it feels wrong to not be honest. It feels wrong to say something that I don't actually think or believe. So I can't do that. Uh, and also I know that being too honest can be detrimental. So I try to avoid sharing where I don't think people are going to be receptive to it. Sometimes, sometimes I'm, I'm lucky enough to meet people who are also pretty honest and I get an honest moment with them and that makes me feel like I can reciprocate. I can then be honest back and I just try to read it from there. Uh, but if, if, if I don't get any cues, if it's someone who, if it's, if, if I'm dealing with someone who seems to also have trouble reading the room and seems less aware of it, I usually will just stay quiet. One of the things I've been thinking about lately is is how much to talk to people and how much to tell them. And uh, there was a period of my life where I assumed that more was better and that the more I told someone about what I was thinking, feeling, and planning to do, the better. And I've come to realize that that's not necessarily the case, right? That it's just, it's not necessarily an obvious good. There are certain things that uh, even somebody who is as close to you as perhaps anyone in the world might be, they don't actually necessarily need to know everything you're thinking. It might be a burden to them. It might be, it, it, it's sort of an interesting line because you can, you can be paternalistic or patronizing or any of these things, for lack of a better term, of sort of saying, well, I'm going to bear this burden myself. But certainly in a business context, um, or most contexts, there are things that it makes sense to withhold. Um, telling a person certain things might cause them to doubt your ability to protect them, for example, and there's no reason for them to doubt that. Um, that's just one example that I can think of. So I've thought a lot about that lately, not in terms of boundaries, like this is a wall between you and me that I have to maintain, but rather there are things that it's better for both of us if I just keep over here. Um, and that seems to cut against the principle of connection and sharing. And it's sort of with a certain amount of sadness that I've acknowledged that it's true. It makes sense that, you know, even the people closest to me uh, in the world may be keeping things from me and, you know, for, for good reasons, for good reasons. And so that's, that's interesting to process. So I do think about that when I come back to a business context. Here's another, well, I, I actually, it's interesting. I have, a direct, I have a direct recollection of this and it takes me back to one of those moments where a customer lost their, lost their cool with us. Um, we had a very difficult customer and we were committed to being more transparent with them about what was going on. They were always yelling uh, at us. They had the, they, they had their favorite phrase was, were the words clear water. They said, we can never get to clear water. Well, it turned out clear water was totally unattainable because it was a, an impossible ideal of, of transparency and perfection. But we said we were going to be more transparent with them about what was going on. And so we were managing their project very closely and we had set an internal deadline to begin some testing and we'd set it for a Tuesday. And we didn't get to it till a Thursday, you know, so our internal deadline slipped. And we had a meeting with the customer on Friday and our project manager, who's who's since gone on to greater things, um, was very transparent about that. He said, you know, we're here, we're good, we've got the demo, we do wanna let you know that we missed an internal deadline. The customer just heard missed a deadline, didn't in any way process what they were being told or why. Uh, They said that if we were missing deadlines, it was clear that none of us should be on the call. We were wasting our time there. We needed to be getting back to work and, and, and why were these bad things happening? And we debriefed after that and, and you know, the PM said why, well, you know, I was, and I said, of course you were trying to be transparent. That's what we said we were gonna do. And it's very clear that these folks can't, and, and it wasn't really on them. It, and on reflection, they did not need to know this. It was transparency without a purpose. Um, so how much that speaks to the issue of boundary, I don't know, but I do know that, um, Another, another thing that comes up is I was having a conversation with someone recently that had the potential to delve into very sensitive areas. And before going into it, that person said, um, tell me what you wanna know and to what purpose. And I thought that was pretty astute. Um, so, so whether that's boundaries or not, I think having a goal in mind when we share things and, and understanding that there are certain things that it, that it may just not be beneficial to share. 
I think some of us sometimes have an idealistic approach to this where we say, you know, we have to share everything. We have to be maximally transparent. We have to be truthful. We have to tell our spouse or our loved one everything. And, you know, I've seen cases where maybe not. Like nobody teaches you how to fight with your significant other, right? You, you don't go to class for that, right? They teach like all sorts of ridiculous stuff in high school. But like the one, I remember the first time that Christy and I shared an apartment together. She's like, you got to go to therapy. And it was like super cool. I almost remember getting like flashcards of like, hey, how to fight with someone you love. Like, don't keep a list. Don't say always or never, right? Like just like little flashcards. And the list keeping thing, I used to keep like a grudge list for all the employees. And I didn't really know I was doing it. And uh, I was bemoaning somebody's performance to Christy one day. And she said, you know, John, if somebody's taking a test, you should probably let them know they're taking a test. And that like really clarified things for me. Um, it, it also reminded me that I wanted them to fail the test. I wanted to be proved right. Son of a bitch was letting me down or my assumptions about him were right or whatever. I really, and, and so I started, whenever I would have a conversation or I would get a video from somebody or I would get a document from somebody or I would get an email from somebody, I would stop and say, what do you really in your heart want this to say? Right? Do you want them to f up? Right? You, do you want them to be to to do what you expect them to do, or would you be happy if this is like good to middling work and you can improve it and ship it to the client, or do you do you want this to be, you know, this to really suck so that you can feel righteous about it? And it was surprising. I was it was surprising how I felt because I often wanted people to just you know meet my expectations and wait it out there, and. Once I started doing that, I started to react, I became less reactive to what I was about to read, whether it was good or bad or, or whatever it was. That, you know, I think just now that I'm saying it, I'm realizing why it worked. What, the reason it worked is it reminded me that my reaction was part of my story, not about the content of that email or the content of their work. And once I saw that, that it was kind of arbitrary, I was just less reactive. Um, I may not have been happy or whatever, but I was much less reactive. And of course the feedback I gave them was not reactive feedback, right? It was coming from this place where I was looking inside first. And it was really this simple thing of like, are you, are you setting up a test for somebody? And then what do you really want the outcome of the test to be? And those were the two questions that got me through a lot of, and now, you know, I have a team that's been with me a long time and like, you know, I'm, I'm not like the greatest, but I'm not as coarse. Um, as I was giving feedback and just interacting with people. And I can be, I can be much more encouraging. And I generally want people to succeed and do better than me and all that stuff. You know, I'm not betting on their failure, which is what I was doing. Right. I think that's what a lot of managers are doing. You want to feel vindicated. You know, you bet not, you hope everybody just lets you down because then it's not your fault. with the things that I have gone through, losing a job, being responsible for uh, my family financially, you start to calculate all of the risks that you take. And I have so much to say and so much to, um, so many ideas and, and am I always, confident and uh, to speak up there's a level of um, fear that I still carry with me um, I wish I had the ability to ask for forgiveness later and that's something that I'm actively working on. I, I reached this moment in my life a couple of years ago where I said enough. I'm tired of that feeling when you go home and you start to think, I wish I had shared this or I wish I'd given feedback on this. Um, and I'm not saying I, I'm this visionary, but I have a unique 
skill set and a, a different perspective that I feel like I often keep muted. Um, those of my peers around me who I'm very comfortable with, they see it and I flourish and I, I thrive and, and they are able to um, see that value that I bring. When it comes into me being in larger meetings with more leadership, you constantly are second guessing, um, uh, should I say this now? Should I bring this up? I, I feel like there's two things. One is being a female and finding your voice after going into this, um, as you're having a family, you go into this very submissive, lay low, say yes to requests, get through, you're, you're pregnant, you're not going to get promoted. So you're, you're, you've sort of conditioned yourself to feel, um, take notes for the team, take meeting minutes. This is, this will, uh, bring, uh, add value to what you're doing right now. Rather, what I really want to do is talk about, hey guys, uh, elephant in the room, this idea I don't think is great. Or let's, uh, I mean, the, there's such a huge gap between who I am and how I, I show up. Um, and a lot of it has to do with this, um, when you're moving forward and operating out of fear. And I constantly, I may do this too much. I look back. I look back and I analyze and I say, what could I have done different? Oh gosh, I wish I had formed better relationships. I wish I asked, um, connected with um, some of the senior leaders one-on-one -on -one and understood what, it, kind of humanized them and not, create this such a big gap in, in, in that I was um, creating in my own mind. So two years ago, and it was the most uncomfortable exercise of me putting one-on-ones with senior leaders, uh, CMOs, CEOs, some that I worked with, some that are um, were part of my network that I never leveraged. And having conversations with them. Um, it it's it has helped change um, how I approach these larger meetings, where I see myself. I'm they're not a I'm not a child. They're not a grown up. We're we're equals, and I I, I am I'm slowly finding that empowerment of um, of my voice. I like to be in a leadership position with whatever group I'm in. It's very hard for me to just like take a seat on the bus, right? And not, and I'm having a lot of problems with that right now because I have been uh, trying to be more involved politically, given our current political situation, things move too slow. I try to get more involved, you know, in my kid's school, things move incredibly slow. And so, uh, so I definitely, I have a challenge with always trying to be the one to like be in charge. Right. And so what I've been working on is, okay, there, there's, there's certainly some benefits of stepping back, right? You don't get, you don't get burnt out. You don't take on more than you can chew. You know, you, uh, you know, you can't always be in charge, but more importantly, and maybe this is cause I'm getting older, like Molly, sit back and listen to somebody else's ideas. You know, you don't have, you don't have all the answers and if you could be patient maybe maybe something better would come along and so I've, I've been pretty deliberately trying to sit back um, and pay more attention and I it's not easy for me right <laughs> because things don't get done it's not necessarily it's my way it's mostly it's just not done as fast as I want it to be done but there's a huge value in like waiting and letting other people weigh in and maybe coming up with a better solution uh, than just the immediate, like get it done kind of thing. So I think that would be, that would certainly be a challenge I have of trying to, um, 
yeah, trying to listen more and be patient. At first, the only way I could do it was just get out of things entirely. Right? I, 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 I literally quit or finished up several of my obligations. I'm on several different boards. Um, and I was like, you know what? I need to, I can't just suddenly not be in charge. And so I'm just going to stop. And I took a break for a while. And then I was like, well, I still want to be involved. And so as I'm kind of trying to get involved in things again, same thing. I said, listen, you're going to get involved, but you're not going to take over. You know, you're not going to take it all on and you're going to try and listen and learn from other people. And that's, again, it's been challenging. And I, and I don't think it's because I want it done my way. It's always because I want it done faster. Right. And I have like, well, let's just do this. Why would we need to explore these seven different possibilities? The answer's right there. Well, other people have to work it out. Um, I know I have kind of a long, stupid example. Do you want to hear it? So it's really stupid, but, but it illustrates it. So the, the PTO, right? Every year there's a fun fair. And so what they do is all the kids bring in items, Nerf guns, whatever. And then, and so they were like, okay, so the, the PTO ladies got together and they're like, okay, well, all the kids brought the items to the school and we need seven minivans to go get them and bring them back to Heather's house. And then we're going to package them for raffle items, right? We'll package them up and make them look pretty. And then we need to bring them back. But, you know, we don't have enough minivans. So I'm sitting there and they're going on and on and on trying to figure out how they're getting enough minivans. And I was like, can't we just wrap them at the school? Like, could we just wrap them at the school? Right. And they're like, oh, okay. So we did that. And I was like, oh, that's great. They're going to do that from now on and save a lot of time. Well, no, it turns out the whole reason they want the minivans is those women wanted to sit around and drink wine and socialize while they wrap the presents. <laughs> so I missed the whole point. Like I was being very efficient. That's the piece I'm trying to learn. Just because I have an idea that makes it efficient. It, it was a social thing for them. Something I continue to struggle with is um, standing up for myself and going after what I want balanced with the fear of being pushy or um, being not taken seriously. And, you know, it's like, uh, I, I, I sometimes feel like I can be, when I do decide to go after something I want or to stand up for myself, I worry about being overbearing and being perceived as like, oh, there he goes again. You know, oh, he's so difficult. Um, I think part of that uh, does involve uh, being a queer person in non-queer spaces. And uh, even when it's spaces that people would assume were, were queer friendly, I still have um, feelings like, um, and I think, I think women go through this all the time, <laughs> of, of feeling like, oh, if I stand up for myself, I'll be considered uh, bitchy or whiny or problematic where I definitely feel like there, uh, there, there are straight men who just do not worry about it and who don't, <clears throat> who aren't um, pegged that way. So that is something that I continue to struggle with, uh, that balance of not letting those fears get the best of me, but then also not being too pushy. <laughs> um, and I've had it, I've had experiences go both ways um, far too often where I didn't, where I didn't speak up for myself strongly enough or I hoped that my subtleness would be perceived and that I would be recognized as deserving of things. Um, and then I, I wouldn't get those things and I'd, you know, you get, you don't get the promotion you want or you don't get the assignment you want. Um, and it's like, 
oh, after the fact, you're like, oh, I should have just said I wanted it. But there have also been the other things where I've, I have uh, argued for what I want and argued for what I think is best for um, an organization I'm involved in or um, a meeting. In a particular meeting, you know, there might be a situation where I feel strongly that something is best and I have alienated, you know, I have not gone in my way because I felt like I've alienated people. So that's something that I, I continue to struggle to find a balance with. Um, and that's when I go back to what do I, what do I, what are my goals for the situation? What do I believe the organization's goals are for the situation? And is it worth um, fighting for? And the other thing I found is it's important to have allies and to bounce these things off allies and say, hey, um, I really think we should be doing this. Do you agree with me? Do you, do you think that I'm um, being too pushy about it? Do you think um, I'm not considering all the points of view? Do you think it's worth fighting for? Or should we let this one go and fight for something else? And sometimes I've also learned to ask my partners in crime and my allies, like, would you mind being the person who spoke up about this first and I will support you? Um, and then the next time we'll switch. Um, and I found that that has been really helpful. I've always believed or felt like uh, I'm sort of a sensitive person, right? I, I, I naturally look for insights into people's feelings and their needs or, or the unstated um, concerns behind their speech or their expressions and so forth. I think part of that comes from just being in the context of me having grown up in multiple um, social groups in different, for lack of a better word, class environments, you know, between the poor and the rich and the, the affluent city folk, non-city folk. And I grew up in mines, I grew up in cities, I've traveled to almost every country in some continents you know i've i've lived in like not just being a tourist i've actually lived among <clears throat> and, and found myself becoming sort of a natural native if you will you know in, in in different places and and i think through that you you get exposed to to just a a a, a collage and a gamut of ideas of emotions and feelings. Um, and you, you learn to be sensitive or tuned to that, or you learn to be able to code switch, so to speak, right? <laughs> You're like, okay, well, that's not being angry, that's being concerned, or that's, uh, well, that's being really pissed off, even though, you know, in another context, that's, they're just like slightly annoyed, or um, that's not anger at all, that's just really, they're thinking really hard, you know, and, and being able to parse all the cues that you get from expressions and um, facial expressions, body language, speech. Um, I think in some ways this comes from just the pattern recognition machine getting attuned to, to all these things over and over again. You know, like the, 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 you, so, so I don't know, I know it's not conscious, you know, but I, I do feel like that's, that's been a strength. I don't always get it right. Um, and I don't, and I, and I know today that um, that my initial instincts about things aren't always correct. I, I'm not. I'm not good at this by any means. I think I'm, I'm self-aware enough to know the moments when I'm, when I fail, but it doesn't mean that I don't fail. <laughs> I fail all the time. <laughs> I screw up constantly. <laughs> I don't know if you can see it. 
because uh, I, I got this recently. Ah, uh-huh. As they will soon pass. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's great. The um, and and beneath that, I know we can probably see it. That it, there's um, an emotion wheel, right? So, ah. Uh, so that so that I can look at it and go like, how 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 do I actually feel? And then then so like narrow it down to to the core of because uh, I I sometimes have trouble. I feel sometimes, uh-huh. but I I can't really put words to it. Uh, and that sometimes it confuses me, right? It's it's like. Uh, what 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 is this thing like? Uh, um, and and then I go look at it and say like, which one speaks to me? Go like, okay, well, I can I can uh, I can do something about that, or or just recognize it because it's not often about doing something about it. It's about I recognize it. I can I can I see you. You can stay there. It's fine. Uh, is what they say about emotions, right? They're great companions, but they're bad leaders. Something I really struggle with is self-awareness. And I've become aware of this over the course of my career. And it's always sort of a blind spot for me. And what that looks like is kind of losing track of my needs or wants or um, ideas sometimes in a conversation when I'm so honed in on understanding the other person and what their needs are and what they're pushing for. Like I can read that really well. And then sometimes I lose track of myself almost in the conversation. I refer to the like leaning into someone as sort of merging with them. You almost merge your uh, your view and your emotions with them in some sense where you're kind of merging and losing track of your own self-awareness. And when that happens, I think there's a couple of ways you could, de- I can detect it in myself, which are um, there. I think one way I detect it is if I realize that I'm like totally disconnected from my actual feeling body which can easily happen when you're on a call or something you just forget your surroundings or that you need to breathe or that you need to drink water at least in the hour um and so i notice if i'm in a meeting i can i'll notice like signs of stress either like sometimes a little tightness in my chest just like i haven't been breathing fully um i'll notice that suddenly i'm just really thirsty and i wasn't paying attention And then I also know that if I wasn't paying attention to my physical surroundings, I probably also wasn't paying attention to my emotional um, settings. And so then I'll I'll know that I'm losing track of um, my own needs and wants and desires in the conversation. And also having the knowledge that my needs and desires and wants actually add value to this conversation and are probably required, just knowing that, and and I've had to learn that, is um, can also help me um, kind of put those two things together. And just take a step back and take a breath. Any other actions besides taking a breath? Like it's taking a sip of water. What else do you do to kind of get back in your body? Um, well, I specifically, uh, and this is something that's hard for me, is take time at the end of the meeting for sure, um, which is also needs to happen during a meeting. Um, if it's in person, then it might be a good time to if it's been a long meeting just like ask for the meeting to adjourn for five minutes so everyone can get the water or um, grab a snack or something Um, if it's uh, a virtual meeting which is more common um, it would it would really just be like making that connection like hey if i'm disconnected from my physical surroundings what needs and wants and desires am i feeling or sensing that need to that i should probably consider bringing up yeah, that, sometimes I wiggle my fingers and toes. I do something to call attention to my extremities. Somehow that pulls me into my body. Is any, does, it, does it ring true for you or is there anything you do like that? Um, sometimes I will, uh, I mean, I, I like to pace a lot on the phone. Sometimes that also helps just keeping the thoughts and everything moving versus sitting stationary. I think pacing is a, a great thing for me when it comes to talking to other people and staying aware of things. Um, I, I don't think I wiggle my fingers or toes or anything like that, but maybe I'll try that. The hardest thing for me is uh, confrontation and that it's great to be able to get along with everybody. And then there are times when I need to say something that isn't 
going to be, you know, it's not what someone wants to hear. And, but it still needs to be said. And I hate it. 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 Uh, in every part of my life forever, except for when I was a kid and I was unaware of the people around me. <laughs> <Even back then. laughs> um, but since I've been an adult, like that's, that is a difficult thing because I, I just don't enjoy conflict. I'm not comfortable with it. And so I have been forced to learn how to do that better. And it's still, it's not comfortable at all. And I don't think I'm great at it, but, um, but what has helped me just do it period, like have conversations that are difficult. You know, one example was a, a call at work where I just felt um, disrespected and kind of demeaned and dismissed and, uh, and not validly. Like there are times when I would think, yeah, I, maybe I'm coming off half-assed and I don't really know what I'm saying. That's, that could be dismissed. Um, but what I was saying was true and valuable and it was dismissed and that was really hard to deal with. Um, and I, I first had a venting call with Martha, my, my go-to ear, um, just to get it out and explore like what was my reaction? What actually happened? Like try to distance myself from the event so I could analyze it. Um, and that, uh, was great because she was, you know, distant from the event and could help analyze it also. Um, and, uh, and that helped me to see the other person's potential perspective. Like it could be they were reacting to something else and <clears throat> didn't intend to be insulting and um, I felt attacked or helped me to try to get in the other person's shoes and not just be mad. Um, and then, you know, there are a bunch of different, um, different but similar guidelines for how to have difficult conversations, like how to set up the frame and, you know, how to, how to talk through it. Um, and it's, it's, it's not too different from like uh, the marital counseling cliches, like I felt X when this happened, you know, and trying not to blame people. Um, I, I found a couple of framing devices and wrote out some points for myself to remember and asked this person for a call and had a call and said my piece with my little script, uh, which I need scripts for this stuff. I'm not, you know, naturally I'm just going to, if I'm trying to have a difficult conversation and I don't have a script, then I will just kind of fizzle into an apology without even thinking. Um, and it was fantastic. It was fantastic. He didn't mean to have the impact that he had. I got to hear more of what was going on um, behind the scenes that led to the way that conversation went. Um, and our working relationship has been awesome. Um, so it's, that is by far the most difficult thing. And I'm happy to have done it a few times and have a positive outcome because now I think, whew, okay, it's worth doing. It's always gonna suck, but at least I know now it's worth doing. Yesterday, we had a customer that um, was, was, we were under the impression that they were possibly leaving us. Um, and it was based on, you know, hey, here's this email that came in with an, a, a, a meeting invite with a bunch of other people, and one of them was a competitor of ours. And we're like, oh my gosh, how did they enter the picture? And why are they sliding into this customer that's been with us for years? And immediately, my reaction was, oh, we gotta, we gotta go in there. We gotta knock this thing down. We gotta chop off that branch of the tree, and we gotta knock this thing out. And so I get on the phone with the customer, and I'm like, "Hey, how are you guys doing?" And so forth. By the way, we got this email announcement. Oh yeah, that was a total mess up. It was our Microsoft Teams, and it sent out this meeting announcement to like 25 people, and it was supposed to go to four. And I'm like, "Yeah," because I saw uh, these other people. Oh no, that was somebody that we worked with well before we worked with you, and and this was just a mistake, and so forth. So rather than just having the um, curiosity of, oh, somebody else is coming in, or they might be working with this person or bringing them in. My, my go-to is, oh, defend, defend the camp, right? You know, put on your armor, go out there, as opposed to just having a, hey, 
Uh, John, I noticed that uh, someone you, you sent out this email and a number of other people and so forth. So again, I think I, I have to keep my gun in the holster and just ask some questions a bit more. I think I, I can jump uh, to the aggressiveness in certain situations. I think I've gotten uh, good enough to query my team. Should I be having this conversation? No, you're you might be a little too hot. Let's let me take first stab at this and so forth. Um, I think, you know, again, I get through these things. I struggle sometimes, uh, but I have a team that I can trust to, to either help me or measure me, uh, uh, tamp me down a little bit or carry it, uh, carry the water for me at times. But it is something that I can on occasion get too aggressive too quickly. And really, I, I look at myself and I laugh later going, gosh, I was I was churning myself up and I didn't need to. This was this was just a no-brainer. It was a simple little technology fart that happened, and uh, nothing bad uh, occurred of it. But I'll let myself kind of spin it up into something sometimes before it is anything. In a situation like that, if it's a little hotter, right, and you actually have to catch yourself, do you know? Do you know how you catch yourself? Yeah, if I catch myself, just. You know, if I if I catch myself escalating verbally, if I catch myself typing longer than I should, this should be a quick email. And if I start going into long descriptions, I'm trying to justify or I'm trying to pound in uh, a situation. That's another thing that I, I constantly do and I have to get better at. If I'm trying to make a point with a staff member, a client, uh, my daughter, my wife, I'll make the point and then I'll make three more points just like it. I'll just keep kind of hammering as opposed to, hey, drop this, you know, share your point, let them digest it, and then come back to you. But I'll just kind of keep coming and keep coming until, and everybody just, I can at, it, at times um, blur, you know, my, the, the recipient can just go, yeah, I got what you were saying the first time, and then you went on for three more minutes. I've been at certain points in my career beholden or felt beholden to people that in retrospect, it probably had their own interests at heart more so than, than my own. And I've, and maybe this is a woman thing to some extent as well, um, to feel that you need to sort of take care of other people, including your clients and, and then realizing, well, everybody's kind of in it for themselves. And sometimes I felt, in working for certain people that that they're sort of taking advantage of their position to maybe either get a better price or to make you work harder or to de devalue your work in some way and it could be you know from something very minor to something kind of more more serious and um and as i've gotten older and more mature i'm starting to value myself more and i don't mean just from a money perspective although that is part of it um, I think the more experience you have, the more valuable your time is. That's just sort of how it goes. And um, the more you are able to tap into those experiences, the more value you offer. And so you, you are worth a higher rate. But when I was younger, I didn't know that. And um, I didn't necessarily have the ability to sort of capitalize on my own strengths. So I worked for people who would hire me. And then at some point you kind of realize for whatever reason, you know, uh, well, this person either isn't paying me what I'm asking or they're constantly asking for more than I was prepared or they're changing the contract in some way, you know, without kind of asking directly. Like something about this has changed. And sometimes I've been really confused about exactly what that is because it's very covert. Like sometimes it's not explicitly set, right? And so you're left wondering like what's going on. And to me, that's been a sign that something's wrong and it's not me because I'm very upfront. Uh, one thing that I really dislike is sort of subterfuge and, and uh, kind of like passive aggressive. If there's a problem, I want to know what the problem is. I want to know what I can do to make it better. Even if I'm the source of the problem, <laughs> I'd rather that than be like, what? I'm so confused. What's going on? I don't know. I don't understand. And so to me, if that's happening, it's a sign now. And now I, I used to be like, oh my God, I did something wrong. I need to fix this. And then I just sort of start experimenting. Well, maybe it's this, maybe it's that. And I've realized over the years that it's sort of a, a habit that certain people get into where they don't explicitly say what they want because maybe what they want is not part of the contract to start with. And they sort of like start to see what they can get from you, right? 
And if you respond to that and you're very insecure as I once was, you give them what they want. And so it encourages them to do more and to try more and to take more. Maybe it's emailing you on the weekend or you know, getting mad at you for something that wasn't your fault or, or whatever it is. But the problem is separating yourself. Sometimes you're dependent on those people for work, right? What do you do if you have, you have clients and you know, they're paying your bills and you're like, okay, now I need to replace this client with a new client. That's very hard to do. Um, and so I've, I've been there and now I have to say, since I've sort of been slowly realizing this about myself, I am worth it. I do have something to offer. Um, you know, I have experiences valuable that can really help my clients to be more valuable to their clients. Um, so I'm been more surrounding myself with people who, who understand that and who know what I'm about and who are, um, coming to me for my expertise and, and are looking to improve themselves. I am a perfect case of an immigrant who is son of another immigrant <laughs> who is <laughs> living in another country. Uh, my father was Lebanese, my mother is Venezuelan. I was born in Venezuela, but I was raised as a Lebanese kid living in Venezuela. And for the last 20 years, I have been living in Mexico. My wife and kids are Mexicans. And, you know, it's a complete mix of cultures. And it, it has made me uh, more caring, especially the Mexican culture. They are... I don't know if it's the correct translation, consideration, you know, to consider the other one. So you try not to hurt his feeling, you try not to make him angry, you try to help on, uh, within the, your possibilities. Okay, it's part of the culture, everybody more or less do it. And well, for the last 20 years I've been doing that. I think that's an, an, influ an important influence. I, I believe that if you send a call email, sending the, the blah, 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 contract, clause, number, blah, 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 and it's not my problem. Okay, you may be legally off the hook, but you won't cause, you won't help the other one. Okay, so in, the, in a philosophical way of thinking, I think it's an act of giving love to the other one. I have a, a proper definition of love. I believe that love is the search for well-being. And when you turn love into an action, it becomes a verb, it becomes to love. And to love someone is do anything you can to pursue the well-being of the loved one. And providing good tech support in some way is an act of love. Hmm. Creating a great solution to help your customer is an act of love. So if you work, if you live in this frame, you know, in this, if you have this way of living, I believe that everything will always do better than worse with everybody you have a relation with, not just customers, but family, friends, and neighbors and it, it is all summarized in one word here in Mexico it's called consideration you really don't know how much your emotions can affect other people and especially if you're in a leadership role <laughs> you're you're kind of you're going to be projecting your emotions on other people even if that's not your intention even if you don't notice it if you're stressed you're going to give stress to your team if you're anxious you're going to give anxiety to your team if you're angry you're going to make them feel uncomfortable um so you know if you're having a bad day just tell everybody it's okay um i think it's hard because I always thought of this line between my professional life and my personal life. And I never thought it was my business to share things with the people I work with. Um, 
but sometimes it gets to the point when something really bad happens, you have to tell them. And you'll be surprised how much people are willing to help you, you know? And that's been really transformative for me. And I think it's really helped um, the health of our, our team as a whole. Um, we have a family business. Um, my dad started Small Co. and I work for Small Co. And my god sister works for Small Co. And when my brother passed away, uh, we all had to take a break. And it was kind of a mess for a long time because, you know, I tried to return to work in some way after a couple weeks, but I wasn't there 100%. Uh, but our team was so compassionate, you know, where you have to pull back. Um, if you have a good relationship with your team, like they're going to fill that place. And they really did. Um, so, you know, sometimes I'm, I'm just having a really crappy day and I'll, I'll tell my team like, Hey, well, some people on my team, Hey, can you keep an eye on the, on the tickets that come through today? I'm, I'm really out of it. And they're going to understand because they know, they know me and, and they know what I'm going through. So um, something I've tried to be is more transparent and honest with people about how I'm feeling and not saying, oh, this is your problem. Help me. But can you do this? And people want to know how they can help you too. Um, I, that's something, you know, if someone's feeling distressed, I, I ask, you know, what can I do? And if you can allow somebody to help you, in some specific way. Um, I think that's the best thing you can do. So shame. I, this is something I'm still struggling with. Um, and I think I figured out that it's kind of a, a weird form of internalized misogyny or sexism, um, feeling like I can't be emotional in my work or um, creative or, or leaning on my communication, um, feeling like I have to be logical and rigid and I don't know, I guess results oriented and like boring. <laughs> the corporate uh, soulless robot type of person. And I, that's just not me at all. And I hate it. And I'm part of what I'm trying to unlearn is that kind of forced stereotypical masculine perspective that I think most people are taught just because of how, how everything is set up right now. Um, and learning to be more open and okay to open up when I do feel shame or when I, when I'm having a bad day or an off day, um, and letting myself do the work that I enjoy and not feel like it has to be more logical or, um, rigid and masculine and it's shape that the work that I'm doing, even though it's not a million lines of code, um, has value and is important. And that's an ongoing, that's an ongoing practice. I didn't realize how much of my life is driven by anxiety. And that has been daunting. Um, because I feel like, I feel like a lot of my role is to be the, the cheerleader. And so you can't be like a mopey cheerleader. That's nobody wants that. Um, and so it's really overwhelming to not know what to do with those feelings. Um, it's hard when you want to 
motivate and be a mentor and do all these things and somehow your own brain isn't there doesn't want to work or is mad or frustrated or whatever whatever the feeling is um and anxiety for me means that my brain is it means i'm impatient and it means i feel i feel broken and it means i am overwhelmed and it means that i can't function at other parts of my life and so it's 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 this overarching fear to admit that i'm anxious because then it's like i'm i feel broken or i feel like i i'm not i can't do things well or or correctly um and that's not how i and i feel like i can't support other people and that's such a crappy i identify by that so much that when i lose it um it's it's really overwhelming um and i feel like i'm letting everyone down and that's a shitty shit feeling um i don't know how to slow down still um i think i do and i i i think all i know how to do right now is to tell myself you're being anxious um but i don't know what to do about it usually and so i know how to cope with it because i've coped with it for so long but i don't know i still don't know what to do about it um and there's this little bit of fear that if i change it that i'll lose who i am and this is i mean this isn't a new thing that people think or say you hear this all the time from therapy sessions and whatever that you, you don't need these terrible these these over these overwhelming feelings to to make you who you are right um they aren't your superpower but that's kind of what it feels like um so the anxiety is what what definitely brings me down um and it makes me impatient and it makes me frustrated and it makes me oh god it makes me so narrow minded i don't i don't understand why people don't just do what i want because my anxiety is in the way like i just need you to agree so that i can stop being anxious about it and um that doesn't that that's not how it works it's just not how it works in march of 2018 my wife was diagnosed with stage 4 lung cancer and from that very day um that night we had a conversation about we know what we we know what we know right we only can impact and we can only work with the information we have which is at hand right we and i i realized i can't do anything what i can't do anything about it. and it became very clear very suddenly you know just okay we're going to take the recommendation of, of professionals and we're going to move through this and we're going to do what they say but there's there's two ways to go right one is to be foolhardy and say at, at that point we could have said ah oh, this will be fine you'll you'll get through this and the other thing was on march 9th we could have said oh my god you're going to die but neither of those were true because there was still a lot of journey to have to a lot of choices to make and frankly one of the big choices every day was waking up and saying am i going to wonder how many days i have left with my spouse or am i going to um or am i going to enjoy the days i have god it sounds so easy right mm -hmm. wasn't easy up until that point my wife and i had done a lot of work together about control and um you know controlling what you can and that kind of thing and and a lot of work together we did a lot of work together it was kind of a, th a thread through our marriage and why it was a good marriage um but boy when when you know it's like you can train for battle you can train for the game but until the you know until you've got to charge the enemy or until you've got the ball in your hand all that training that's 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 when it locks and that and, and i'm saying for me that's when it locked, right? When I actually had to wake up every morning and decide whether she was gonna live forever or she was gonna die tomorrow and realize that the reality was somewhere in the middle and I didn't know the answer and I just had to stay with it. That helped me viscerally refactor my brain for acceptance. 
so it's helped me that way. It's also helped me in the business to realize like, I'm not going to watch the bank account every day. I'm not going to worry about the client who's 48 days late on a payment. I'm just going to pick up the phone and call them and go, Hey, you're 48 days late on a payment. And what's the worst thing you're going to say? I'm not paying you. I'll say, okay. You know, like I'm, I feel like I'm tempered like a steel blade, right? I've been made hard by the fire of the experience I went through. At the same time, COVID and a daughter, you know, being the parent of a 12 year old girl who saw her mom pass away is leaves me incredibly vulnerable. And there are times that I'm like floundering, looking for this strength that I, that the acceptance has offered me, but not being quite able to find it. Right. Because just when I thought the worst thing, you know, that could happen to me, happened to me. Now I'm running a business in a global pandemic, <laughs> which is good and bad because the, the help when it's there that my experience has afforded me it has been great, but also, you know, there are times I'm still, I wake up at three in the morning. And the demons are right there at the foot of the bed. I think I said it before, but it bears repeating. The best way for us to learn from each other is to make ourselves vulnerable, to tell the truth and to listen. Thank you for listening. Now go tell the truth.